Uh, well, just about good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Joint Growth Infrastructure Planning and Economy and the Highways and Environment Cabinet Panel, Wednesday, 17th of March 2021. I'd just like to make a few announcements, please, on behalf uh, in view of the COVID regulations. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link to the, on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak, and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish, but cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate, or in the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. I'll declare the result after each vote. Officers are present at the meeting and will follow the same protocols. Uh, officially, breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. I'll suggest to you that as this is only a one item agenda and that some members will be going off to a, an employment uh, committee which has to start prompt at 2 o'clock p.m. If we can finish by 1.45, that will give them the statutory 15 minute break. So if you can work on, work on that basis, that would be appreciated. There are a few substitutes uh, for both panels because uh, some members could not obviously sit on both panels. And I'd just like to run through them and welcome those substituting. Uh, on the growth infrastructure planning and the economy substitutes, we have uh, JSK substituting for SJ Featherstone for this meeting only. And the highways and environment substitutions are MA Watkin, substituting Fesco Jarvis for this meeting only, Jay Billing substituting for A Khan for this meeting only, and F Guest substituting for JA West for this meeting only. Uh, we have only one apologies uh, from Graeme McAndrew from the Growth Infrastructure Planning and Economy panel. Um, there's quite a few members here, so forgive me if I don't um, ask you to all introduce yourself as is normal. Um, fashion, uh, protocol, um, but I think we know who, who, who we are. Uh, item one, or can I ask members please to disclose any pecuniary or declarable interests? There are none, thank you. Right, first of all we've got public petitions and we've received none. And the main item on the agenda is the Hertfordshire Place and Movement Design Guide and I'll introduce Rupert Thacker, who's the officer leading on this. Uh, so Rupert, over to you. Thanks, Phil. Um, so morning, everybody. It was, or afternoon, I should say. Um, so the existing Roads in Hearts document uh, was adopted in 2011 under the LTP at the time. We've sought to update it and, and um, we'll be bringing both this section and a subsequent section through joint panel to bring members up to date on any key policy changes and direction and approach to both not only developer um, led schemes on, on the highway, but also our own schemes that we'll be implementing, as well as guidance and um, I suppose a policy direction that we'll be working with our local planning authorities through this process to achieve so that so we get better alignment uh, for these developments across the board. We've chosen um, with our exec members to rename the document the Hertfordshire Place and Movement Design Guide, which is a shift away from the previous Roads in Hearts title. Um, Mark Youngman, who will come on next, will run you through a brief sort of 15 minute presentation to highlight those changes that we've made to date in the chapters that we're bringing through this particular um, panel. We'll be back in the summer with the subsequent uh, remaining chapters that will then be wrapped up into one public facing consultation that will be carried out later in the summer prior to changes to the revised document being made and brought back through a subsequent joint panel prior to it um, being considered for adoption by Cabinet. Um, so Mark, if I can hand over to you uh, to run through the, the presentation and then we'll take any questions from members after that, if that's okay with you, Phil? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rupert. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rupert, for that introduction. So, like Rupert mentioned, I've got a, a brief presentation on the main changes that we're proposing and the work we've done thus far on refreshing roads in hearts or what was roads in hearts. So I'll just upload my screen. Please bear with us. Okay, yeah, so, see that. excellent. So as Rupert mentioned, we've got a new work in title. Um, it was Roads and Hearts before that came into or that was adopted as a policy document in 2011, uh, several years ago now. So we we do a refresh of that document. And this is the new work in title, Half Cheer Place and Movement Design Guide. And that's what uh, the name that we'll put out for consultation in the summer. So just to remind members where um, this document sits, it's one of the key supporting documents for LTP4 and certainly one of the main standards that highways refer to uh, when designing and working with developers to design new roads and footways and cycleways. So the purpose of this first panel report on the new guide is to set out the proposed structure and, um, and and where we've got thus far and seeking your endorsement with the direction of travel and looking at uh, the context of the production of more detailed guidance so we've done most of part one and part two of the four parts and uh, we're continuing to work on the back in the background on the um, particularly part three and part four with more of the details so we have 33 chapters in draft the text We've still got to add in a lot of the imagery, photographs and architectural sketches, but the text is predominantly there um, as appendixes uploaded with this report. So I mentioned the four parts. These are, these are the four parts and just to briefly set out their purpose. Part one is setting the scene and talking about the uh, not only existing, uh, but future DM processes. Not a lot has changed in, you know, in the Highways Act since 1980 in the, the way that we facilitate developers and our own schemes on the network, uh, talking about Section 38, Section 278, etc. And then part two is the vision, looking at how we as a council would like our developments to look in the future and changing in line with LTP4, the hierarchy in putting walking and cycling first. Part three is everything a developer needs to get a uh, proposal to outline permission. So all the, all the information they need and uh, talking about the hierarchy and um, how uh, we want our roads set out and talking about street trees and all the other and drainage and all the other important elements and assets um, that we would be looking to adopt from developers at a point in the future. Part four is the detailed design that really gets into the nitty gritty of uh, how wide we want a road or a corridor and uh, the specifications for street lights and swales and all the other matters. And, you know, it will it will talk about visibility displays and all those in other important factors and set out where we either depart with national standards or we want to align and we would be quoting things like manual for streets and the DFT's DMRB, design manual for roads and bridges. So throughout the document, the draft document, both this half and the further half coming forward later in the summer, we've got the, the three main golden threads that run throughout the document. Place and movement, which members have, have seen before, that the place and movement um, strategy was was laid out previously so that you know it's, it's sort of in the title now so we're we're keen to support the whole philosophy behind place and movement sustainability runs throughout the document and looking truly into the future about future transport and considering things uh, like electric vehicles and electric scooters etc and then asset management so um, obviously got our eye into the future and considering those assets that we take on and the cost implications of that affects our maintenance budgets etc so we want uh, to obviously set out to developers what type of materials we're interested in adopting 
and what arrangements we would have where there are special materials, the enhanced materials like granite, etc. So just to set out the four parts in more detail, these are the chapters that make up part one. In green are the chapters you have or the text of uh, as appendices to the report. So you can see that we've predominantly done the text for part one. The bits in amber or orange are the bits that we're still working on in the background um, and to a large extent have been informed by some of the early work. Part two, that's that's pretty much all done for the text. Obviously, we've got to come up with a lot of the imagery ready for the public consultation, but uh, you can see some of those golden threads running through those important chapters of part two. Part three, this is the section that uh, gets developments and our own schemes to outline design stage. And you can see we're, we're, we're sort of about half done on, on those appendices and uh, the orange ones coming forward later. Part four, detailed design. Got a few of those done by working with specialist teams across the authority, but a lot of those other ones you will see uh, in the summer coming forward as appendices to the next report. So in these draft chapters that are on, on the web page uh, and they are appended for discussion, these, these are the six main areas of change, I suppose, in setting out. Obviously, the greatest need is to confirm that uh, our street lighting has changed. Uh, we need to get our specification out for LED lamp columns and the way we manage our street lights with the central management system. So that that's, that's quite an urgent one to get um, landed. And then we talk about maintenance and operation and how we um, plan for those assets into the future. And we, we're really challenging developers to be clever about that. And talking about the public realm, which we need to do since government have uh, sort of put the put the stops on shared space for a little while. So we, we've got to start informing developers what we want public realm to look like. And place and movement and, and master planning. We're, we're looking really to bring a lot of the early work forward with developers. So bring a lot of the planning process a lot earlier in pre-app discussions and agreeing the principles before they submit a planning application. Because quite often when we only have 21 days to comment, that's too late in the process for us to really influence the design. And then sustainability, obviously a lot of the recent work you've seen at the earlier panel um, with, with Julie's new team working on sustainability. We in development management have got to work closer with that team to make sure that our developments and our own schemes are coming forward in a most sustainable carbon low fashion as we can achieve. These are some of the images I've taken out of the uh, chapters. This one in particular on the left here from part two, chapter four, talks about master planning and totally appreciating policy one of LTP4 in switching the hierarchy in that we're trying to make the most direct routes for walking and cycling in orange and yellow on the left here. Buses obviously weaving through the development so that they get the necessary catchment to make their services viable. And then for anyone who's tempted to jump in their car to drive to the shops or the school, etc., not necessarily making that the most direct route. That could be more convoluted through the development to get to the things so that you know people think twice about using the sustainable modes. And that's how we've flipped it on its head and want developers to start thinking. The place and movement grid in the bottom right, you've seen that before, looking at the nine new road types that we're we're working on. We're we're well on the way to specifying what those those look like now, and we'll come forward with further details on that. In the top right is a, an image from Healthy Streets that we also support and are looking to measure a lot of the schemes coming forward against Healthy Streets. So as a joint panel, you're invited to note the following key issues arising from developing the new approach and a lot of these, well, half of the text that we've got done. Um, is this need to front load a lot of the planning and design effort with the schemes preparations life cycle? So bringing a lot of that work forward uh, with the planning teams. We might have to grow the planning team to to achieve that and less of the 
of that design input coming later on. And there's a need, if you've read the government's white paper on housing and, and changing the whole, the way the planning system could work and the current consultation out for MPPF and the National Design Code. And that's a theme that runs throughout that, is, is, is making sure that developments at even local plan stage are proved as viable and deliverable. So we have a part to play as a highway authority in doing that. So um, the, the next piece of work, second bullet point here, is the extension of uh, more testing regimes. We're developing testing regimes to, to show uh, how our own schemes and developer schemes comply with LTP4, measuring against the 20 odd policies. And that's a piece of work that we're certainly testing at the moment. We call for sites on, in certain districts and we want to see that. Uh, um, we'll have more details at the next committee, but we want to see that uh, used for considering all large sites, major sites. And then the other issues about master planning, public realm, sustainable modes of transport. We've had a go, a good go at uh, uh, defining what we consider, HCC considers sustainable modes at the moment. I've got a slide on that later. And we're looking to be much more transparent on commuted sums for maintenance. So they are the fees uh, that we can take through legal agreements to charge developers for future maintenance on assets that we see as non-standard or extra over, over what we have to take as a statutory role. And then we also want to be um, reconsidering uh, the adoption strategies in looking at um, clever stewardship in models that might sit between full adoption and us not adopting at all where it remains as a private street, looking at models that exist in between. Them. So some of the work um, we've been doing in trying to get some uh, com compliance testing across the board, no matter who the works promoter is, ourselves, major project, smaller schemes or developer schemes, is looking at the model the government use uh, in the gateway schemes for DFT schemes and then aligning that with all our other types of schemes to see where there are synergies and where we can use common tests no matter where the scheme is uh, emanating from. So although we can't show you those tests yet, we, we, we're getting on well with it. So this is just a, an update in our current thinking in looking at uh, these three level of tests for schemes that are coming in and there will be some form of checklist uh, or, or clever survey system in, in, in way of scoring and then the output we're hoping we can show to the local planning authorities and yourselves as members in a very uh, you know visual way of showing how a develop how a development might be uh, good bad or <laughs> average in regard to LTP4. As part of that work we've also been doing in the background uh, looking at almost a gap analysis of where what we're currently testing, where we can currently measure how good a proposal is and where we might have gaps. And obviously the tests we're developing, we want to fill those gaps. So this is one page and we've got the policies listed on the left hand side in LTP4 and looking at the ind each individual item, whether it be uh, the blue infrastructure, the green infrastructure, air quality, and seeking where the what tests we current, what tools we can currently use, what we can combine. Can we can can we streamline the process by combining some tests together, so that you know rather than have a hundred documents with a submission, we can narrow that down to half as much because we do find a lot of paragraphs from developers are duplicated. That's the second page of the policy uh, consideration. So with regard to sustainability, health and being future ready with highways, um, our vision is to create and maintain roads in Hertfordshire in a sustainable and balanced way, enhancing the natural environment and creating opportunities for our communities. We will create a road network that actively supports healthier, cleaner and more active travel that is resistant and flexible to changes um, in the future, particularly with the climate based trends. I'm not going to read this all out to you. Um, but just briefly, this this is uh, the principal changes in the master planning chapter, and it really talks about us considering proposals in light of the character. You know, we, we totally appreciate that our towns and villages are not all the same across the county, and that one design that fits 
uh, in the middle of St Albans wouldn't necessarily be the same and we needed in, in one of our villages and we needed a different design for that so we've got to set that against the context that may be defined in the future in the local design codes be that will need to be developed by the local planning authorities. We also in this chapter talk about density um, from a transport point of view we actually want our developments to come forward um, quite dense uh, because what it does is it gives us more opportunities for active travel and it gives the public transport side of, of the business um, or, or the public transport providers more chance of viability if there's dense developments if it's too spread out they don't get the the quantum of, of passengers and and the third paragraph here talks about that everything close proximity ideally we want to see mid-sized developments come forward with that are mixed developments so they have not just residential but they have a good mix of retail and commercial so that people can live and work within the same site within the red line and if that's not uh, viable because they need a certain quantum of residential then we'd be looking for at least local shops schools churches um, etc to be locally served uh, and and not support developments where they're just residential and miles away from all local facilities for example the last paragraph here talks about speeds we've in december members approved the new refreshed speed management strategy and you, you'd probably heard in there that it supports to, uh, all developments being or residential developments being 20 mile an hour zones so this document has got to tell developers how we do that and we don't believe it's just a matter of sticking the signs up it's they've got it's got it starts with the design speed they've got to get the design speed right and we've got to get the right measures in place so that they're self-enforcing so part of dense or, or developments that are um, going to work with with that are mixed use is about being permeable and we want them to to have the white right walking and cycling routes throughout them and they join up they connect with the existing right rights away network etc and then the rest of this page talks about parking and we we want to challenge developers to get to to, to think about parking barns not necessarily believe that they have to provide every household with a driveway for two vehicles uh, or assume that the street outside that we're going to adopt is, is okay to take parking out the front. We, we, we want to see, uh, encourage them to come forward with developments that are clever about parking and uh, consider parking barns or uh, car-like developments. So our definition of sustainable modes, I mentioned that earlier, this is our current definition in, in the draft document and we'd welcome comments uh, so public transport obviously sustainable and then we talk about walking and cycling the active travel modes getting and obviously that feeds into to healthy hearts as well and getting people active and, and healthy uh, micro mobility options obviously this policy will will uh, be good for several years so uh, although a lot of these micro mobility options are not lawful in certain areas at the moment we you know we support them in that they're they're active they don't use fossil fuels and then in red at the bottom we talk about where we feel car sharing carpool and taxis fit in at the moment street lighting just briefly summarize the key points in the street lighting chapters uh, in paragraph 6.1 we've said that for the moment we're not supporting that our lamp columns are used as electric vehicle charge points and part of the reasons for that is that we put most of our lamp columns at the back of the footway so we would have concerns about trailing cables over the footway and then obviously the highway authority being liable liable for trip hazards the next paragraph here 12.8 um, we're, we're looking to define a list of off-the-shelf heritage style lamp columns so we'd have our set standard columns and but we, we'd like to have uh, a specification for some off off-the-shelf heritage style and that's that's because we don't want I suppose all developers using a mixed number of different assets the Victorian looking black type lamp columns where where we just wouldn't be able to stock that so we want to try and limit the range that they use and the last paragraph here um, is, is being clever about uh, the adoption strategies in looking at different ways of 
uh, maintaining the assets that possibly sit behind between full adoption and to keep keeping it private. And also challenging, I think, uh, that in rural and semi-rural areas that we don't necessarily need the developers to light everything because they do tend to come forward thinking that lit areas sell better, therefore they'll light it. And, and that does cause concerns in some villages where it might be the first development that gets lit. So at the moment, we're, we're still asking the question, what does good look like? Because we've got to, um, once we can get out there and start doing uh, more non-essential site visits again, we want to get out there and take photos of uh, some good examples of sites for, to furnish the document. So we're certainly doing a lot of thinking in the background at the moment of what good looks like for Hertfordshire. These are two examples that are in Hertfordshire. I mentioned place and movement earlier. Just briefly, it's good to see that that's now getting embedded within other um, authorities' documents. This was the draft to Quorum Strategic Design Guide, uh, albeit circles instead of squares, but it's still the place and movement grid that we're we're proposing, with nine different road types. And just briefly, what this design guide does is it talks about the three on the right-hand side, where we would be allowing developers to use enhanced materials and certainly a 20 mile hour zone and then on the left hand side would be more our, our traditional safe and operational where there would be uh, you know more tarmac etc also in the background just briefly um, we've been doing a lot of work in looking at how using this opportunity with the new standard to really challenge how we do things in development management and looking at how we can do things more efficiently and um, and 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 bring in the right tests at the right time and and for to get technical approvals and adoption in the right way. It's also worth noting while we're developing our own design guide that the government's got a current consultation out for the national model design code, and uh, that came out on a Saturday, end of January, and we've only you know we've got uh, only a couple of weeks left now to. Um, to comment on that, which we're we're working on our comments in the background. Commuted sums, mentioned them earlier. These are the the draft commuted sums. We we will be rounding up or rounding down these figures to the nearest pound before we go to public consultation. But it should certainly help um, prop up our you know help with our maintenance budgets of some of the uh, enhanced assets coming forward from some of the big developments in the future. There's two pages cut straight out of the document. So that's it. Thank you for your time and listening. Thanks, Mark. A couple of things. Can you turn off your mic, everyone? Is there an echo? That seems better. A um, couple of things before I invite questions. Uh, first of all, Theresa and uh, the panel, could we please note? that David Barnard has given uh, apologies for this meeting. He, he was with the um, Gripe panel. Um, just a sort of a little quip um, to Mark, perhaps we should have actually got a registered trademark on our place and movement um, diagram because I see decorum uh, plagiarising it and making it circles rather than squares. So that could lose in translation right across the piece if we're not, if we're not careful. Anyway, I've um, got a lot of questions. Uh, Derek's the first. So I'm just switching myself on. There we go. OK, good morning, everybody. Um, as vice chairman for this particular joint meeting and obviously the executive member for growth infrastructure planning and the economy, I'm more than happy to um, support the uh, uh, the proposals here and the resolutions on the order paper. Um, I think Rupert alluded to the fact that um, to some extent this is work in progress. There's more to come. And I think we should just bear that in mind. Having said that, this is fairly radical stuff and a big departure from the previous design guide, which is pretty much about roads and not much else. This, um, I think this um, very encouragingly um, adopts a much wider holistic approach in terms of um, design, environment, sustainability, um, which I'm 100% um, 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 in support of. And buried in all of this is some fairly radical stuff. Um, I just really want to um, 
raise a few uh, points in passing, but um, I appreciate that, um, you know, um, um, other members may have points of clarification. And I just, at this point, I think um, after the election, where we have a whole raft of new members, we need a workshop on this, actually, um, particularly in, in the light of the fact that most of the new members are probably superannuated district council members who really need to uh, understand what we're trying to do here. Because um, I only had a, a, a meeting recently where um, there were issues with the local planning authority. Things do get lost in the system. So it's very important we get our members, particularly the two tr twin trackers, up to speed on all this. But that's a bit of an aside for the moment. Now, um, the hierarchical approach in LTP4, we need to embed throughout all of our documents. And I'm going to make some references to the page numbers of, of the um uh, of the document um, to just raise a few um, um, minor, in some cases, points, but just to illustrate what I mean. The first one is on page 131. And for those who can't find it, we're talking about active travel. And there's a sentence in there which says, uh, increase the priority of pedestrians relative to motor vehicles. Well, actually, we need to increase the priority of pedestrians relative to cycling and motor vehicles, both of which are lower down the priority than the pedestrians. There is a view amongst certain cyclists that actually they should come before anybody else. But the fact is we need to just ensure that whatever we do in design terms, we actually make sure that pedestrian always comes first. So I think there's just a little bit of um, emphasis needs to be put in on that particular point. Um, I'm going to refer to page 133, where there's a piece about airports. Um, there's a reference in the document to the fact we're opposed to new runway development at Luton and Stansted, which we are, but our actual policy position is a bit stronger than that. And um, we just need to look at that sentence to reflect the fact that we're opposed to substantial um, expansion of those airports rather than just second runway, because we know you can cram a huge amount onto run one runway and uh, so I think um, that just needs to be looked at again. Um, I think Phil re um, referred to the, Phil, the permeability diagram. I think it's on 187, which I think is a brilliant diagram. It sums up very visually what our objectives are. And I think we should um, promote that quite a lot. Um, a word on commuted sums. I noticed the page on commuted sums, which is all very helpful for um, developers, et cetera, et cetera. But it's only in the public sector you get a figure of £9,242 or it isn't a few pence. So I would urge officers just to just to round those off a bit because, um, uh, uh, you know, I think it looks more professional in many ways. Um, one of the um, radical departures, and I think, um, in a sense, buried to some extent, is when we talk about bus laybys. We are no longer going to build laybys for buses. And that's highlighted on, I think, page 245. Um, if the bus stops, the traffic stops. We're not in the position anymore where we wanted to get buses out of the way so the traffic could go quicker. And I welcome that move. But that is, that is actually quite radical on what's been the assumptions in the past. Finally, uh, from me, uh, my bet noir is garages that are too small to put cars in. There is a, um, um, a, a, um, some paragraphs on garages in further in the document, page 257 in particular. I think we just need to make sure that um, we just keep an eye on this. Um, I went to a recent housing development. More garages you can't get the cars in, let alone a bike and a car. There are some very good examples of new developments where some thought has been, been given to design of garages to ensure there's plenty of room to put their car in, get the bikes in. Um, plus a bit of storage. We don't do that. We get streets cluttered with cars. So I think that's um, an issue. I think we need a very close eye on. Uh, I'm sure all this has been recorded. There are a few random thoughts from me, but and, and, but I say I'd like to support this because I think it's a very, very encouraging, radical move forward for the County Council. And I hope all members of this joint panel will wholeheartedly support it. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. I agree with you, Derek, about the, uh, the garages and making them big enough. I think there are words in there to say they have to fit a sort of a standard family car with a space for cycle down the side. But there will be a, um, an interesting discussion, um, hopefully agreement with LPAs 
to actually get this through on design, well, on actual development. Yeah, just to come yeah. back on that, I agree with you totally. Yeah. Uh, and we are reliant on the local planning authority supporting us on all this. This is why I think the uh, those members who are members of planning authorities really take to, to, to take some responsibility here. But I was saying as an aside that our own on the other side of our own uh, organisation. Our property department are still building houses with garages that can't take a car in a cycle. I say no more. Yeah. Hey, does anyone, do you want to come back on that, Mark or Luke, or just note those um, interesting comments? I think, to the, I think the, we can note that, Phil. We, we, yeah. we can pick that up and um, reinforce some of it uh, after the, the consultation. If Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Eric. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you, Mark and Eric and Phil. I've had the uh, the privilege of seeing some of the presentation before. It's a great piece of work. Um, the, the bit that I just want to comment on is on section 20, um, where it talks about the front loading planning design effort. And of course, I think we, we know with the amount of growth across the county, on the red line, of the planning development and what may need to be front loaded. And I, I presume that we will be highlighting that to the planning authorities given a wider knowledge, knowledge than just the individual application. And I guess the challenge is always gonna be <coughs> around the viability elements because uh, the developers may then come back and say, well, okay, if you want us to do more on the infrastructure side of things beyond what we feel is our um, uh, responsibility then some other things may need to go so yeah just just noting that it's a bit of a challenge but a really welcome thing to see on there thank you chairman that if you like yeah. phil sorry shall i pick that one up phil yep yep so i i think it's very worthwhile eric noting that one and, and we've made a big effort um through the ltp4 compliance tool um which which is really trying to to create a golden thread from the start, the very start of a local plan process where um, local plan authorities are identifying sites for us to be able to work with them and give a view on whether or not we feel that they fit with the LTP4 objectives and what might need to be done to help shape those developments so that they can, if they don't in the first instance, particularly some of your, your more edge of town or, or more remote sites that start to come forward. So this is this document looks to weave that thread all the way through from right right from the early stages of a development coming forward. I would say pre-developer application, much more around local plan, call for sites and strategic assessment, all the way through to getting it built on the ground, the use of the sort of healthy hearts approach to making sure that developments create spaces that people want to use in line with the LTP4 hierarchy. Thank you. That's yeah, good. No. Thank you. Fiona wants to come in. Thank you, Chairman. There are two points here. The first one's on page four, 6.4, setting the scene and development management processes in Hertfordshire. And how are the new processes going to involve the County Council working with the District and Borough Planning Departments? That's the first point. And the second one is on page 19, 15.10, that whole life management planning adoption and stewardship and on studs and part of our strategy includes the setting up of trust companies to maintain to manage the maintenance of a part of the highway and public realm including studs this is welcome because in my division there is a private housing estate where when it was built some years ago a drainage scheme was built it wasn't maintained I got a phone call from a constituent at 3.50 in the morning because it's flooded. Thank you, Fiona. Mark, you might want to come back on the relationship with LPAs. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Phil. So, yeah, I mean, we're keen to work um, closer with all of the planning authorities. We've got 11, of course. Um, and although this is just in draft at the moment, I'm, with your endorsement today, then hopefully, you know, we can start having those conversations with the local planning authority and starting to share our draft documents and and working where there's some synergies and we can do a bit of joint working rather than 
you know doing some work in parallel i mean we have we have landscape offices with the district our own landscape offices looking at highway trees could we join that up similarly with suds with the ll with the llfa um would like to do much more joint working with the the lead flood authority um so yeah that's we're really keen to do that um although it's all in draft at the moment with your endorsement we would start having those conversations with the districts and and our own planning authority to to see where we can uh, where we can be a bit more joined up yeah. as as to the second point you mentioned suds um like i mentioned uh, um, at the moment i suppose we're unlucky in that thames water is the only water company that doesn't really want to take on suds <laughs> uh so we we do have a part of the county where where it's anglian water and we get a bit more uh success there with the water company wanting to adopt suds sustainable urban, urban drainage systems but um but yeah and with districts wanting to take on less green space that is part of the reason we need to get the commuted sums done because then we can have a bit more interest in taking on some uh, swales and drainage basins because we'll have a facility to pay for it. The drainage is very important because by their very nature developments will actually um, reduce the drainage capacity or reduce the soak away. So anything we can do to get through the development process improvements to the drainage system including cooperation with water companies would be welcome. I'm sure everyone would buy into that one. Um, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chairman, um, and thanks, um, Mark and Rupert. Um, you know, this really is uh, an excellent piece of work, and uh, obviously, it's it's still um, a work in progress. But um, you know, for what we've seen already, it is something that's very much very much needed. Um, I just wonder. Obviously, uh, I think you said it it will be sort of finalised uh, towards the summer. Um, assuming then it again goes to consultation. And I think you mentioned um, working with um, or consultation uh, in a relationship with the LPAs. Um, I can see that obviously being being key, um, uh, and and so that this will be seen by LPAs as if you like the Bible, the Highways Bible, on um, on what develop developments should be uh, being provided, which is great. Yeah, I, I would also stress. I think what's important is that. It's also recognised nationally. Um, I think you mentioned the National Design Codes um, uh, that this complies with uh, uh, nationally because we've seen in the past. You know, you, th you you think you've got strong policies in place with uh, district and neighbourhood plans um, uh, in development management, uh, and then of course um, the develop. You know, you re you refuse it on on um, whatever uh, policies. Uh, it then goes to appeal and you find that the, the sort of government appointed um, inspector, planning inspector, um, overrules you uh, because you're, uh, he, he disagrees with your policies. <laughs> so I, what I'm basically saying is it's very important to have this document um, uh, with the LPA's approval and consultation, but also also nationally. Uh, which I'm sure you're doing, but I think I think I really do think it's key. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some great some great work in here, um, especially with uh, on developments um, designing our uh, our roads for speed limits. I think that is that is brilliant. Um, you know, so if if you're proposing a 20 mile an hour road, you design it as such. So. Um, it doesn't need uh, enforcement, which we found is, um, is, a, is is key. Police aren't keen on enforcing it. Um, the road should um, should be 20 mile an hour compliant. So that's that's brilliant. Um, and you mentioned, uh, and it's great to see uh, drainage included in this now, because that's uh, a key area where I don't think it probably was uh, a sort of highways um, issue before. So it's, it's good to see that being brought in. And um, you mentioned about charging points, uh, not allowing charging points on street street lighting units. Yeah, quite understand that. But I do think we ought to have something in, and and maybe there is something in there, or it's something you're working on um, for um, ch charging points. I mean, this is obviously going to be the future. 
you know, it's not going to be too long where uh, every property will need a charging point at their at their premises. So as so as as well as providing um, the appropriate parking spaces for vehicles, it would also uh, have to have the appropriate uh, charging points, charging system. And um, interesting with the the parking barns, of course. That, that I think that's a great idea. Um, you don't necessarily have to. Why, why do you need to park right outside your house uh, overnight, you know, and you've got a parking barn where obviously you would probably have um, uh, proper uh, EV char charging points there. So, yeah, excellent ideas and um, look forward to, to the work progressing. Yeah, fully support it. Interesting about the EV charging points um, or on-street charging, uh, Jeff. I can tell yeah. you that uh, guys around this table, Rupert and me, et cetera, have been wrestling with the concept of on-street parking because we can't yet see how it would work. And we would start yeah. off by saying you wouldn't put a petrol pump on the pavement, would you? And, and, if, you have, and if you have sufficient charging station with rapid charging um, and sufficient off-street charging and car park charging and destination charging, you possibly won't need them. But I would just let for a challenge that you can come back to us, not in this meeting, but whenever you want during this consultation process. And also on the EV charging uh, position statement that we we'll soon could publish. How could you see on street parking working? And I'll give you an example. You have a street of terrace houses with a load of cars parked, one side or two sides. And some of them are electric, some aren't, since the ones with electric want EV charging points. So they want designated parking spaces for their car. OK, so how do you police that? How do you prioritise who can go into that space to charge their car? And are they going to get up halfway through the night to move away so someone else can use it? But how would you actually work it? So if anyone can come back with a system, we'd be pleased to consider it. I mean, we're actually talking to Oxford, who are leading the way in this week we consider and i looked at their sort of strategy the other day they do not mention on street parking uh, the charging wow yeah so it's it, it's obviously a challenge it really is, it is yeah um, but and, and it's it, a challenge nationally in fact worldwide probably yeah um, yeah so if you come up with a with a scheme let's let's hear it uh, but for but, new developments of course the parking barns idea absolutely brilliant yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah Looper. But, but, yeah, thank you. Well, I was just going to make that, that point really, Phil, that the guidance does create an expectation upon developers to be providing off-street provision, yeah. both within your more traditional kind of setting, I suppose, where, where you would have provision for an electric vehicle charging in a front garden, but also for flatted and barn type um, you know, parking facilities, multi-stories or, or um, barn style developments where we would expect there to be both a level of immediate provision but also passive provision that would mean that you could cater for a fleet when it becomes 60 70 80 100 percent electric in the future yeah. i just wanted to ask mark can you see the um relationship or dialogue with planning inspectors being easier bearing in mind the government are coming out with their own guidelines and we're coming out with our guidelines which will hopefully sort of complement each other. Do you think this uh, conflict might sort of be a thing of the past in the future? It's, it's a real interesting one, Phil. Um, traditionally, when we've refused applications, it's generally been on the premise of old MPPFs, which um, that magic word severe, that you know, people find difficult to define. We always say it's got severe impact on the highway, and it's usually for one or two reasons. Uh, the first one being congestion, causes a, you know, a congestion on the network that we just cannot live with. <laughs> um, or secondly, road safety. They're the two main reasons we've refused in the past. Going forward with the proposed MPPF, if, if it lands, and, um, and the design code, we would not only be able to use those reasons, but the LPA could actually object saying it's not beautiful enough. That's a word that's been spattered around the, the new draft is uh, it talks about character and beautiful and, and quite subjective words like that. So it's going to be really interesting going forward to see um, 
case law. You know, it'll be case law effectively, the outcomes of uh, uh, appeals where a planning inspector will come down one side or the other on whether they support the LPA in saying that it's uh, not a beautiful enough development or or doesn't meet the national design code because the way the code's written at the moment and there's a lot of debate whether it'll actually land how it is but uh, if it did land how it is um, the LPAs are encouraged to work up their own design code which would probably end up as an SPD uh, supplementary planning document um, to support their local plan but in the interim the national model design code becomes the template becomes the and they've actually said in their document that it has planning weight. So the day it's made, that national code would have weight. And we could refer to it in our responses in the same way we, we mentioned manual for streets. So it's and, and it's got closer synergies with manual for streets. So in our comments, we'd be we're, we're saying that we're a bit concerned that it's it's reducing our options because it doesn't mention DMRB at all. So for some of the bus routes, some of the faster spine roads where we do rely on DMRB to get a safe, you know, 40 mile an hour road with the right turn lane, for example, it, it doesn't talk about that. It just it just talks about um, manual for streets with the smaller visibility displays. So we do have a, our concerns, but ultimately, let's come back to your question, we, we nationally will be People in my field will be looking keenly um, at um, the outcomes of in inspections in future. Yeah, thank you. And the new guidance is one that we certainly support the direction of. There are nuances within it that we're pulling together in our response to the consultation where we feel that it should be more ambitious to be supporting the creation of spaces that uh, recognise our user hierarchy, place pedestrians and, and more vulnerable users higher up the tree and, and, and doesn't necessarily design for um, the private car in the first instance. So I think we'll be pushing a little bit harder and probably citing some of the work that we've been doing for this new um, Hertfordshire Place and Movement Design Guide as uh, maybe being slightly ahead still of, of where some of this emerging government guidance is. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sharon. Thank you, Phil. And um, most members, when they get a 370 page uh, report through for, for an agenda, sort of your heart sinks a little bit. But I have to say, uh, Mark and Rupert, um, that the document is interesting. It's, it is innovative and, you know, really the, absolutely support the direction of travel and, you know, crystal clear, even for a non-planning expert uh, like myself. So um, I'm grateful for that. It's really helpful. The only thing I would say is it is a very dense document. I've got loads of comments to make. I'll try and be concise. It would have been really probably been quite helpful to have a member seminar or something on this beforehand. So uh, we could have, you know, um, in the confines of a one and a half hour committee, it's quite difficult to discuss all the issues that come out of this. It's a very big and important document. Um, Phil, um, I think uh, you will know uh, our pain over Stevenage High Street and I think the the issues around Stevenage High Street I'm not mentioning that to be parochial I mention it because it's probably happening all over the county where we we have got a certain distance on climate change and what we're going to need to do for the future but the public aren't with us yet and uh, you know it's those issues around parking around street cafes all the ones we're facing where we've got an enormous job to do in terms of communications with people. They are just not coming with us at the moment. They want to be able to drive their car wherever they're going, park it right outside their house when they get home and park it right outside the shop they're going to when they get wherever they're going. So we have got a journey to do on that. I've got some specific points to make. The, the, the two general ones are first of all agreeing with Derek about the airports issue, which I think needs strengthening. Secondly, um, there, we do have areas of the county where um, presumption in favour of development is in place because of uh, housing delivery targets. I'm not going to comment on the, the, the reasons why that might be the case. We also have extensive permitted development in our county and um, I think we need to be watchful that we get as much as we can from documents like this and make the point back to government that it doesn't matter, we can sit and write these documents, but if, as Jeff said, inspectors overturn decisions or we get PD or we get presumption in favour of development, um, it, all of this work gets wasted. So my, my specific points were around the 20 mile an hour zones. 
Um, we did have a, a, a very, I thought, eloquent presentation at full council around value for money on these schemes. And um, I didn't, that made me think about value for money through the whole document. I didn't see anything in the document about that. And I do think it's important. It's important to us, but it's also important to the public that we're making sure we're getting value for money, uh, whether we're implementing schemes, whether we're putting them in, whether we're talking about commuted sums and all those things. So, um, uh, I think, and, and also on 20 mile an hour zones, it needs to be made, if it's so encouraged in new development, which I know is what this document's mainly about, we need to make it easier to do in other places as well. It's still quite a, a labyrinthine process. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, COVID. There's a lot in here about parking and street cafes and stuff like that. There's been a big change in those things because of working from home. And I just wondered if that had been thought through about I know it may or may not be permanent but it is likely for the future there will be more people working from home. Um, I did want to ask about adoption of roads and this is probably me not having read the document carefully enough I apologise if it is but uh, I, I hope we're not saying that the County Council uh, won't adopt roads because we've had lots of problems all over the county where people uh, residents find themselves responsible for uh, the maintenance of roads or they don't get maintained at all. So I'd be grateful for some clarity on that. Um, cycling, uh, both on pa page 201, where the, the, you know, the statement about presumption in favour of cycling and the, and the commuted sums uh, pages on 215. Um, I, I, I take the point about commuted sums, but, you know, ongoing maintenance of cycleways is a big issue and we do need to make sure that whatever we do here, we're doing something that will be sustainable way into the future. Um, healthy streets and living streets. Um, it's about the point Jeff made about partnership with local, uh, with district authorities, planning authorities. I hope we can have a good partnership working up a model for Hertfordshire. It could be really forward thinking, I think, if we work together and create something that designs healthy and living streets and it can be retrofitted in some cases with the uh, with the joint working between the highways authority and the local authorities and I'd love to see that. Um, one uh, question around um, street lamps, which is a question a constituent asked me yesterday, which is why we don't use solar for street lamps. There may be a very good technical reason, I don't know. Uh, and my last point, you'll be pleased to hear, Phil, uh, is about um, the parking barns. And just to plea, um, I, I support the idea, and we've been looking at potentially converting garage blocks in Stevenage to use as parking areas at the end of streets if we're going to have living streets. Uh, without cars parked all along them. But we do need to think about security in those areas uh, because for, um, you know, I, I, I think of this as a woman and for a woman parking somewhere that's not right outside your home at night, you want to make sure you're safe, that it's well lit, that you feel safe um, leaving your vehicle there and walking to your home from that area. So um, the, the street, the safety of streets, and I didn't see much in the document about that, you know, feeling safe in our streets is vital too, and we've heard a lot about that in the last couple of days. Sorry, that's a bit of a list, Phil, but it is a very important and a very um, a very complex document with a lot in it. Yeah, appreciate that. Forgive me if I take some of those as comments, which I'm no doubt be noted by officers. I'd just like to come up with a couple of things myself. You're right about the public attitudes to what we're trying to do on high streets, etc., and anything to do with sustainability. That is, a, I think, our biggest challenge is to actually get hearts and minds coming with us. Whenever I speak at conferences, etc., I always throw out that challenge. I would suggest to all politicians, we all politicians around the table, it does need political cooperation to get that done. Because if one political party uh, sort of um, introduces something on sustainability and local politicians actually oppose it because they think there might be a few votes in it, that's not going to work. We need to work cooperatively to get these things actually embedded in the public psyche. On the 20 MPH chart, I'm not going to open up the debate that's been well rehearsed, but I will assure you that we're trying to make things as simple as possible for 20 mile an hour zones, etc. And with value for money sharply in their minds, because £7 million doesn't, is not going to do everything. So we're going to make sure we, we do the most cost effective measures available. There's a bit about road adoption there, Mark, which I know is a very emotive issue and a bit about the safety I think we need to come back on. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Phil. Um, so yeah, just picking up some of those those matters there with adoption. It, if the design is right, 
if the developers get the design right, if, if, if they make their developments come forward more permeable, so for example, rather than if they follow the guidance properly, particularly the master planning section, and they design it so it's not, you know, a main road with 20 cul-de-sacs off it that go nowhere. If they design it right um, and you end up with, at the end of a cul-de-sac, you have a, a cycleway that gives benefit and really brings in that significant public amenity that starts joining things up. Because we want highways to go from A to B. So so if, if, they, if they get it to stack up and, and the highway, their proposed highways, you know, go somewhere and link to the school and the shops you know it's only recently that we've we're now starting to consider we might actually have some developments where we adopt the cycleway or the footways but not the roads because the roads are just not you know they're just not adding adding that uh, that good value for money i suppose from our point of view in in the reasons for us to adopt it and and talking about adoption we want to, by bringing a lot of our processes forward and getting more involved at the earlier stages, and particularly making sure that all sites are viable, you know, and deliverable in the local plan, we we hope that by showing our curves earlier on our intentions to adopt, that we're giving surety to the public of Hertfordshire. You know, we're giving clarity so they know when they go into a sales centre and buying a house, they they have more sight on whether that road outside the house they're going to buy is is down to be adopted or not and we've always tried to encourage developers to sign up to a section 38 agreement before they start but it's just the way of the world now unfortunately that they start building on fields private fields at risk you know there's a lot more building at risk they literally start building the day after they have their planning permission now so it is a problem but um we're, we're keen for this document to to help with that you talked about solar lighting we've we've certainly been looking at um at uh, trialing solar lighting um it, it is expensive and it and it is one of those we've looked at other authorities and what they're doing and took advice and it's a bit it's a bit of that uh, sort of beta max uh, analogy do we want to jump too early with it and go with the wrong lantern type that could have cost us a lot down the line so yes we're watching the market we're seeing which uh, products are coming out with longevity and are cost effective, value for money. Um, and there are concerns. We've at some of the trials where we decided not to go ahead, there were concerns about tree cover, meaning that the solar panels weren't getting enough light that, you know, halfway through the night, they run out of energy. <laughs> um, that wouldn't be good, right? Um, so yeah, we're certainly considering it. We want to do some trials before we commit to going wholesale and putting it i suppose putting a specification in our guide um you talked about covid we haven't we haven't changed our advice on tra transport assessments so what we asked for from developers in terms of transport assessments but we know in the background we're getting a lot of questions from developers in acknowledging that if they do a survey now it's not going to be representative so we're helping developers out by selling them data that we have from our own counters for example um, we, we pushed them to, to buy our evidence packs that were developed as um, one of the early parts of the growth and transport plans because obviously we have to support if they're using our data. Um, so we're, we're doing workarounds at the moment, but as, as things get more back to normal, then we can certainly, um, you know, we're looking at the models, our, our Comet model and um, and tricks the tricks is the system the national system that we use for recognized trip rates for certain types of developments and tricks are doing a lot of work actually to nationally to advise on um, what the impacts of covid are and what it might go back to because i think we all accept it not all work life patterns will, will be go back to how it was um permitted development like you, Sharon, I, I think we're 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 all concerned with um, I suppose not being consulted on so so much, not having a, an opportunity to comment or impact or recommend refusal even with permit development. Um, our door is always open if a developer, you know, still wants to seek our advice and work with us to facilitate mitigation measures, even when they are doing a office to residential conversion, for example, and need to facilitate a different access on the highway. 
airports. Um, we did we did double check what we were saying with our spatial planning team, and um, it, it's very important on something so strategic and an out of county matter really that we align with LTP4. So we've been very careful to align with LTP4, but not go too far that we might be seen as predetermining the outcome of a, any application from an airport. But talking to spatial planning, they felt that, because this is our effectively our highway design standard, um, that this might not be the appropriate supporting document to go further with airports if members wanted to. It might be that uh, that would be for LTP5 or maybe the sustainability work that we're, we're doing. I think I've covered most of those. A bit about safety, Mark. S safety, well, we, it's so paramount. That, safety. that was in relation to remote parking, Mark, at, um, at in, in our Living Streets programmes. If we're going to have parking barns or remote parking from uh, residential, uh, I don't mean very remote, but, you know, if it's at the yeah. end of the street, it's very important that that's made safe. People it's, feel it's all safe. about design, Sharon. It's, it's all about making sure it's design, it's visible. It's, it's actually in, in some developments they've been rather than um, if you cast your mind back to sort of 1980s type developments, the parking was often tucked around the back in isolated areas that didn't have any windows or, or anybody overlooking it. N new designers move much more to that actually they're on through routes. So it might be that those cycle tracks or pedestrian uh, footways weave, weave through some of these parking areas so there's natural surveillance of them and clearly there might need to be consideration uh, working with developers about whether or not there does need to be elements of um, you know to make sure the lighting potential CCTV and things are built into built in to make sure that like you say people feel safe using it. Yeah if I can add to that um, we certainly have many developers that are and, and contractors that are on the considerate contractor scheme that like to uh, make sure that their developments are most safe. They like to light them, like I said before. Um, and we do know that those developers do, they do consult the police. They do ask the police, a um, bit like we do with our car parks, we're trying to get the, the right tick or car park mark, and they do check, get their developments checked out. And certainly we're, although we might not go as far in the past to say that it's a severe impact, we certainly in our contexts will comment that we don't like two metre wide footways with six foot fences both sides, for example. So, you know, through good design and um, public realm and laying out, we hope, and I, I think that's possibly one of the areas, Sharon, that we would be looking to work closer with the LPA, because quite often some of these areas, um, the desire lines might lie off highway, car park courts, that type of thing with them. Um, and we do like those spaces to be overlooked so have a, you know, like these flats above garages where areas are overlooked. That's my point. Uh, Sandy, you've been waiting patiently. Yes, so waiting patiently, but actually listening with a great deal of interest. And in some ways, um, Sharon and Jeff have stolen my thunder, so I shall be very quick. I was going to make a witty remark about direction of travel, and then Sharon used the phrase direction of travel but you get fine for using that phrase then <laughs> it i mean um, um i think this is this is really interesting i suspect that the world might change much quicker than we realize so i think that even if we think that we are being tough on motor cars we may have to be even more tough on motor cars and i mean sharon is on the button when she talks about the challenge of bringing um people with us and residents with us i mean i would love to see the clutter of car parking on roads removed but of course everybody wants to park outside their house i think we might have a lot of people suddenly being disabled um and therefore requiring a parking place outside their house I was alarmed by the mention of multi-storey car parks and parking barns is much more cuddly. Um, I have no idea what a parking barn looks like. And I hope that obviously there'll be illustrations in the final document, but just to also say, and a seminar for everybody, yes, so we can look at this in more detail. But Derek, one of the pleasures of being on Gripe has been Derek's outings when we were allowed to do this pre-COVID and once we're in a post-COVID scenario, 
I think, a Sharabank outing to go out and be taken round really good examples of new housing development and why we think they're good, where we think they they fall short. I mean, there's nothing to beat actually seeing that and having someone talk through what works and what doesn't work. And if you started to gain how you might change that. And I think that would be terribly useful for us, but also for colleagues who are LPAs. So um, anyway, thank you very much. It's been really very illuminating the discussion so far. Thank you. Um, before I go on to Steve, can I just remind members that the chat function is to be used for voting only? Thank you very much. Um, Steve. Hi, thanks very much. I, I mean, I think Sandy is exactly right in that we may find that the world is changing faster than we anticipated. Um, but I think and clearly we're heading in, in the right direction, but we, I think, need to be prepared to think about how changes in circumstances may may influence the, the details of that. I mean, I was also going to raise the point that Jeff made about the EV charging not being on streetlight columns. And I, I've listened to the response. I think my only further comment would be that if, if we've got a policy that we're not going to provide on street EV charging, then then we ought to say so rather than just be completely silent about it, which appears to be the position at the moment. The only mention of EV charging is we won't put it in street lamps. Um, and I think we do need to be clear where we stand on that, but as that is an issue um, that, will, that the public certainly have a view on and they need to understand the council's position. Uh, the, the second point I wanted to make was um, related to the discussion around 20 mile an hour limits. And, and I think we all agree that it's important to design roads for the right speed. The, the issues around 20 miles an hour are not by and large about new roads, they're about the existing ones. But I think we need to make it clear that the developer is responsible for the entire process. There is a chapter about TROs, but it doesn't seem to me to make it absolutely clear that we would expect the developer to deliver a, a complete solution, including the signs and the TROs to, to make the roads operate in the way we want them to rather than for the county council to have to finish the job once the developer has, has left site and handed things over. My next point was around uh, the, the, the cut of distribution of, of passenger transport into PT1 and PT2. And I think we all understand you know, that, that the, the issues around the, the PT2, the, the car sharing and, and taxis are rather different. I didn't we've highlighted that, but I don't think we've been terribly clear in terms of what we think that means in terms of provision for those those PT2 um, uses. Uh, and, and then finally, there are some references to interactions with the right of way, rights of way network, but it looked to me as if it was just a link to something that existed already. I think there are many areas where rights of way, off highway rights of way, play a fairly important part in providing suitable walking and in some case cycling routes. And I think we need to make sure that we give adequate um, give adequate consideration to that. You know, we're, we're moving away from a, a document that's about roads uh, and that's absolutely right. And we need to think about the, pl the, the part that the rights of way network can play uh, in, in uh, facilitating that. Uh, just for Mark and Rupert might want to comment on a few of those things, but firstly on the EV, position. Um, yes, we are silent at the moment because we're still formulating our position statement, but that is um, due to come now to uh, CLG and go through the process commencing April. We tried to get it to March, but unfortunately the CLG for March has been cancelled, so we can't do that. But yes, we do promise a position statement and I'm sure um, Rupert and co will ensure that we do actually put a statement about why we're not, if we're not, going for on street charging. Um, but do you want to come back on any of those other points, you two? Yeah, I'll um I mean on E V, we we haven't waited for this new policy. We're already working with the districts to try and condition that residential dwellings come forward with E V connections. So uh, but the the on street position is is obviously different to our off street position but yeah we haven't waited and it is like trying to hit a moving target you know you could be asking for a certain percentage of EV at three kilowatts and then seven kilowatts and probably by the time we 
you know get this policy made and put on the website we'll, we'd be upping the um the requirements again so knowing that fossil fuel vehicles are going by uh, or won't be sold by 2030 we certainly within plan periods so we're happy to try and condition or recommend a condition to all the lpas when it comes to ev provision on plot um but uh, yeah i think regarding the on-street position the lamp column uh, issue is a concern and, and we do have a draft position statement um it, it going on in the background which i'm sure rupert will be involved in bringing forward yeah, in on, in terms of the ev i think one of the critical factors is it's not just us saying that we would like 10 percent of existing charges to be ready and to have passive provision for the rest it actually turns out through the discussions we've been having to try to inform our uh, position piece on uh, evs is actually the power supply and what we need to be doing with the LPAs is working very closely to make sure that there is sufficient power serving a development to make sure that it can cater for not only electric vehicle needs in the future, but whatever the houses of the future look like, given they're going to probably be more hungry in terms of their power demands, to make sure that what that doesn't mean is there's going to need to be an upgrade of the infrastructure at a later date, too late for the development to, to make use of. So we're, we're trying to have some discussions with UKPN around that at the moment to help inform our position but also to make sure that we can share that knowledge with the lpa so that they're making some fundamental requests of developers to get enough power into these places rather than just saying we've laid some ducks in the ground it's no good having the ducks if you can't then have the power to to make use of them and regarding tro's uh, i know steve we've worked on some tro's in the past uh it's very difficult for us to uh to condition or or 106 a TRO because uh, you know you have to some LPAs will accept our recommendation some some will not um, and it's all about meeting the tests meeting the planning tests so that's why we've tried to refocus and rather rely on a design you know particularly with a junction design with a visibility display rather than rely on or assume that a TRO can be uh, procured is that we work with developers to get the design right first. Let's get the design speed right so that you're not reliant on that TRO. And then if the TRO comes and the developer, because at the end of the day, we don't want to be the designer. We don't want to tell the developer, you know, apart from our policies dictating that all residential should be 20, we don't want to design it for them and then be responsible for delivering all those limits. But we see the signing as being the icing on the cake. And that effectively, as you know, with 20 zones, we need we need the the traffic that uses that new road to be going at you know 24 miles an hour tops really um, regardless of whether we got the signs or not. I would just share your comments about the rights of way, Steve. That they are vital and and we are trying. Well, we have been working very closely with uh, Countryside Rights of Way. Um, in the development of this document, and we'll continue to do so. And and if you feel at any stage we have missed an opportunity to strengthen both the opportunity to link into and improve our rights away network let us know because that's something that we've we've really sought to weave into this document thank you adam thank you i just wanted to ask about the commuted sums they've been mentioned a few times already my understanding of the commuted sums is like a, a, lump, a lump sum up front so that um, money can be drawn down for it over a number of years um for for um almost like a maintenance revenue um, and, and my question is, I didn't see any mention of sort of controlling for inflation or if there, for example, were real terms increases in a particular material or, or wages or something like that. So really, I'm just I'm just asking, have we have we done something to make sure that when we get to year in the case of structures, 59, 56, that there's still money in that pot? I can answer that, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah there's a lot of work in the background that's why it's come out at quite an exact figure because uh as a team we we do get challenged by developers to to sometimes show our calculations um so we do need an audit trail so if you're ever interested i could show you the massive spreadsheet that we have that uh, that calculates these and that's part of the reason we need to or i'm keen to review it on a yearly basis because what we do use we use two figures we use um, RPI X, so the X is excluding mortgage, for for one of the rates, and the other one we use is the Public Works Loan Board, 
that looks forward into the future for for many years and um, it makes it's the best we've got in terms of predictions of inflation in the future so we we cross reference those two or, or there's a calculation a recognized calculation that comes out of an adept piece of work which used to be the county surveyors say um, so it's it's best practice basically nationally and we've used that is there a contingency built in as well as inflation so the, for, exa for, for example with covid obviously we've had you know borders being closed materials not moving around as, as easily uh, brexit potentially i just wonder if there's some contingency built in because obviously 60 years is a long a long period of time and i just want to make sure there is money there in those final years that to keep keep up the maintenance of some of these things there's I, I think we've we've sort of in doing the calculations we 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 assume worst case scenarios. So although um, you know our maintenance is particularly about um, regular maintenance. So although our maintenance regime for gullies might change, for example, we've made some assumptions on um, you know the, the the best outcome for us, as it, as it were, that we can justify based on on the data we currently have. But it, it's not like so with section 38 and 278, we, we put 10% on, on the bond, uh, which is a contingency, but I think we'd find that hard to justify with commuter terms. It has got to be a, a purely a, a calculation best, you know, based on best assumptions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard. Sorry, Chairman, I was uh, just reading the passage again. Um, of all the items I've heard today, uh, I think I, I, I'm overwhelmingly supportive of the, the whole document. But I just want to, I think I'll, I'll send this to Rupert, but 1510 is the one that talks about exploring creative steward, stewardship models. And then it gives a few examples. Um, I hope very much we will ensure that not only the developers, but the people who are seeking to buy the houses will be absolutely, totally and truthfully warned as to what it means over the years. And I have a good, good example in the Welling area where a very nice estate with some 200 houses has been built very successfully. But there were people living there who truthfully said they did not know that the road approaching them from the um, uh, B197 was not um, to be maintained at public expense. They they honestly thought it was something that would be maintained or built or and, and and maintained by us. Now I think what we need to do is make absolutely sure in this um, creative stewardship model that we make sure that the would-be buyers are also aware of exactly where they stand. Because what happens is, at the moment, they suddenly find their um, the fees they have to pay towards maintenance of the site can just go up and up and up to pay for works that really should have been dealt with at the time of construction. So that's the only bit that worries me from all this document, is how you will make sure the public the buying public are in the picture thank you anything we can do to for the lpas and developers to get that message out i think i think there is phil i, th I think it's about being clear early in the stages of development and having an agreement in place with both the developer and the lpas as to what will and, and won't be being put forward for adoption and then to be clear on the, the areas that aren't being put forward for adoption, how they're going to be managed, which is where the stewardship models come in, be that your green open space or in some instances, you know, the the, uh, the footways and access arrangements that don't fulfil a sort of highway function for, for the greater good. So it's, it's really about clarity records and, and making sure that with the LPAs, probably we've got a way of recording that and making sure people can publicly access it for their own good. Now, that is what your search is when you buy a house for and your solicitor is paid for, is to check to check that for you. And if we make it as easy as possible for, for that to be found, yeah. then people go in with their eyes open. Rupert, would you agree with me that um, really we should make sure that some kind of a plan, yeah. an actual picture, yeah. goes 
through at the time that they're making their decisions. Because a lot of members of the public don't understand the differences, the nuances. Yep. So that's what I'd like to see is a plan that goes forward that shows this is to be maintained at your expense and this is to be maintained at the local authorities expense. Yep. And then what, what we don't have obviously control of is, is how that will be managed by the landowner and what that would mean for potential um, you know, people that have an interest in the site. But yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to take that away, Richard, and I'm sure it's something we will pick up with our LPA colleagues as we go through this process to make sure that we can provide that clarity to people. Thank you. I think solicitors have, an, have something to play here because when you go and buy a house, they do all the searches, including land charges searches, and they should advise their client what their liability is. And if there's, if there's a liability to maintain a road, that solicitor should tell them quite graphically. Um, anyway, the message needs to get, it got through, no doubt. Uh, Paul. Um, I would endorse uh, exactly what you've just said, Chairman, as uh, uh, working in, in that industry. Um, just sort of comment on the document. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's got some really, really great points. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, I think sort of Mark running through it in sort of 15 minutes probably didn't do it justice and sort of following the procession of other speakers. Uh, I think it was absolutely right. We should have probably had a uh, workshop on it. And, and that was before rather than sort of, as Derek said at the beginning, sort of following it. Um, but I, I still think that should take place. Um, I just like to sort of, I mean, whilst it's a good document, I mean, I, I do think the sort of uh, the way the world's moving at the moment and bashing the motorist. I mean, it's not the poor old motorist fault that we are where we are. And, 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 and suddenly as the world's changing and, and I, I, I think we're going to see massive changes on the roads following lockdown. And I think we're already seeing them. If, I mean, if you're sitting where I'm sitting now, you're looking out my shop window, um, the, the traffic, I mean, you wouldn't think it's locked down. It, I mean, in London, it's it, it, it could be, it, you know, it could have been sort of uh, over 12 months ago, as far as I'm concerned, and coming into the office and going home at night. Um, and I think with all the changes that are going on and, and uh, sort of what a lot of the councils are doing, closing off cut throughs and stuff like that, it's going to have a dramatic impact. And I'm just concerned about uh, sort of looking at it from a slightly different point of view. And whilst it's not necessarily our fault or, or necessarily we, we've got a complete handle on some of the um, resolutions to some of the problems, um, it's, it's the idea of what the economic impact is going to be, you know, this sudden sort of change that's going to that, that could take place and suddenly making it difficult for motorists and and high streets being blocked by buses i mean thankfully in my bit of hertfordshire you've got no buses so that won't be the problem to uh, to causing more traffic but you know i'd like to be able to um uh, you know sort of use public transport to uh, get you know go to go to and come back to home from work, um, I don't necessarily want to want to cycle sort of you know sort of 15 miles with you know two computers on my shoulder and a load of papers and a load of other things that I need to take to the office, and I just think we need to have you know there needs to be a solution um, for, you know to, to help mot uh, motorists and, and 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 to sort of encourage people to come out of the car and, and I understand that part of that is what we're doing in terms of you know encouraging more people to cycle, but it's not everyone. It's not a solution for all of us. And I just think that lack of public transport to get from A to B uh, without having complicated journeys. And of course, more, more importantly, it's it's a high cost. You know, it is much more expensive for me to travel to work um, on, you know, and, um, you know, it's sort of double or ten to almost three, four times as as much as using my car. Um, and I just think we 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 need to look at the other the flip side of the coin i think um and just sort of moving on to sort of planning authorities um i think it's a big document for planning authorities to consume i think it was mentioned it was 300 odd pages i think it probably would be useful for planning um uh, planning committees per se to maybe have some sort of introduction to the document and maybe um for them themselves to receive some sort of workshop to understand it better to have better clarity because it's no good just giving it to planning officers letting them consume the document 
Um, and, and then relying, I mean, Derek made the point that we need to go back to our, our respective authorities and, and ask them to um, to pay respect and, and, and take notice of the document. But I think we need to also, as, a, as an authority, Go, you know, approach those planning authorities and committees ourselves, and and work together with the committee to understand what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Chairman. A couple of things there, Paul. I mean, I I would agree with all your sentiments about the need to provide the transport and the, the other means of transport to get people out of the cars, but there's not going to be one answer that fits all. And I think it's fairly much a chicken and egg situation. If we can create the demand, then bus companies will put on bus routes, for example. If the demand isn't there, then they won't. So it is a bit of chicken and egg, and it's uh, going to take quite a while to actually get everyone singing off the same hymn sheet, if, if that is possible. But uh, yeah, it is a good point. Um, the document. I mean, could I just finish yeah. and then come back? The document. Um, I I haven't read it in detail. You might be surprised to know, but I, I have actually challenged uh, Mark, etc., as to how readable this will be for, or how accessible it will be for developers and planning authorities. The thing is, it's the sort of document you dip into. You, you have a particular issue and you dip into that chapter to, to see what you need to do about it. But I don't think anyone needs to read it from top to toe immediately, although over a few years, they, they might know it a lot better than I ever will. But anyway, you want to come back on that, Paul? Oh, no, that wasn't me coming, uh, coming sorry, back, was... Phil. But I just make one point, Phil, that yeah. and I, I, I understand what you said about the, 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 the transport issue. And I sort of some the only thing I sort of fall short of completely agreeing with you is is the fact that if there is a sort of yeah, you know, because there's so much movement coming from so many different authorities to, to sort of squeeze the, the motorist off the road, I'm just concerned that the capacity won't be there in the short term to deal with um the fallout and uh, and what that might be to the economic ac activity of you know uk plc in hertfordshire yeah i know for, for example there's a, a a major development being agreed uh, north of stevenage you might have heard about it because it's quite controversial um but part of the issue is uh, transport and i believe that um part of the conditions were were that the the developers will be subsidized for five years to provide a bus link now that that provides a bus link even though there might not be the demand and only time will tell whether the fact that it's there will actually create the demand to make it commercial to actually keep it there but that's the sort of thing that is happening um with, with large developments so rupert you want to come in rupert yeah I, I was just going to make the point phil and i was just trying to look up the data but i haven't, I haven't quite found it but a lot of what we're saying in this document isn't about changing you know people that that need to use their cars for journeys where it's not where they're not able to do so it's actually about enabling people and encouraging people to undertake those journeys where where they could be doing it differently so your your journeys to school journeys to local shops your your sort of zero to three mile journeys that are quite walkable and quite able to be undertaken by bike electric bike by foot and actually, if you get those journeys off the network, it makes other people that have an, a, a real need to use it, it makes their life easier. So it's about balancing balancing the system as much as it is about getting everybody to change, really, Paul. And, and I think it's just to reiterate that point that there are, I can't remember what it is, but a, a significant amount of journeys in Hertfordshire that you see every morning and every evening in your commute that are only travelling very, very short distances. Thanks, for, uh, Michael. We're almost there. Um, thank you, uh, Phil. Um, I'd just like to say in North Hearts, any planning application we have for just under a year now have to have charging points um, in within their curtilage. And I don't know whether the other nine district or powers are doing that yet, but uh, uh, that's going down well. Uh, I welcome this document, um, especially on new estates, because uh, the county wants to build 3,300 houses around Baldock that I represent. And if those roads under this document uh, will be made to accommodate 20 mile an hour limits, I think it will be a great job um, 
Uh, so I wouldn't like to see that um, degraded anyway uh, when this document is published. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Stephen? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Well, I'm going to disagree with one point I think you made earlier, unless I misheard it. Uh, and that's you say new development can new developments can create flooding. Well, I actually have to say I believe that's completely the opposite. If they are correctly designed in terms of sun, mm. and indeed, uh, given my district wall has probably sixty percent new development in the last twenty years, slightly more. Uh, actually, the flooding is far less because it's been correctly designed in most cases, including a new one very close to me, where you know an attenuation ponds have been put in, no flooding. Uh, as a result and in fact actually new development can assist in coping with existing flooding problems uh, and i'd hate the message to get out that new development creates flooding because in my view it's the opposite i know the general public over there says it will do um, but there are other reasons for that but mo moving on i think uh, this is a lot of good things within this document but actually the crux that it comes down to who is going to enforce it and who is going to police it? <clears throat> I pick on one area in particular, Chapter 14, Public Utilities, uh, 2.6, the provision of public utilities should enable adequate access for operational maintenance purposes, blah, 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 not compromise safety, and easy access for pedestrians and cyclists. What the town centre, one of the principal town centres, upon a huge amount of refurbishment work, what's going to happen, a BT cabinets, been put in east to west rather than north to south, the footway as a result is only two metres wide outside a cafe. Can I get it moved? No. BT want £10,000 plus to move it. They said it was signed off by highways. Uh, the borough said, well, we didn't agree with it. Highway said we didn't agree with it and it's stuck there. You know, in the, in the middle of a shopping parade where actually it's a shared surface. So it is a question of the enforcement we need to learn from where things have perhaps gone wrong in, in the past. Uh, the one thing I didn't actually particularly like in this document was this suggestion of underground garages. I really thought we got away from that in Chapter 7, 1.8, um, I think it is, underground garages. I mean, yeah, I, can, I appreciate that might be a useful thing to have. But to me, that's very much, perhaps I'm a bit too old now, a 1970s hang, 60s and 70s hangover, uh, and most of them being taken out because they become, fortunately, misused for other purposes, shall we say, uh, to put it bluntly. So I'm surprised we're even suggesting underground garages in any of this. And going to Sharon's point, actually, if you're going to have underground garages, you've got to have very good lighting, you've got to have CCTV, they are very expensive to construct. And if you ask developers to put underground garages in, you can bet your bottom dollar they'll say, oh, we can't afford to provide, to provide any affordable housing if it, as you want the underground garages, because that would be their bottom line um, to get out of other obligations. So personally speaking, I, I was a little bit shocked that that was in there. That's probably the only one. Uh, there are already off-grid solar lightings, uh, street lights uh, in Hertfordshire, I've mentioned this before, I assume Mark is aware of them because they're in my district patch in Leavesden Country Park provided by the District Council. They've been in over three years and have caused no problems. Yet it is a pilot, I suppose you could say, it's a limited number, uh, but they are they are very effective. Yes, initial capital costs, they were quite expensive, but it was a better way than actually connecting them to the mains. So they are there and can be done. I think the other the other issue here is how do we maintain the areas or make sure the areas that are not either in public in public ownership either by the district or the county, but actually are required to be kept as visibility splays or as a media land. <laughs> Coming back to my district patch, which I know Sarah Bedford's on this uh, county patch. You know, I've got endless complaints. This is one this week or la rather last week where the land searches have come up, the piece of land that the person thought was his property isn't, it's in public ownership, he's been maintaining it by cutting the grass because no one else has, there's no deeds, there's no right of ways over it, the land registry says it's, uh, it's not clear who owns it. So I mean again it's a historic thing and I do know on other schemes, and quite rightly so, 
visibility spades, which are part of people's private property, have to be not built on, I know, fences or hedges because they're visibility spades as part and parcel. And in some front gardens, there are little bricks saying this is the highway boundary, even though it's part of the deeds of that particular property. So going down the line, I think based on what Richard was saying there, it does need to have some well-documented evidence that when we're, all of us are not around in 20, 30 years' time, someone comes along and puts a wall up there, what was the visibility display, they'll be told by whoever is in control, and the appropriate officer at district or county level, or whatever authority we then have, that they've got to take it down. But if we don't get all these things right now, we are building up problems for the future based on problems that have, have happened over the last 20 years where we come across these examples. On buses, I agree your principal chair and the principal officer saying, you know, there should be links. But actually, to get people on the buses, they need to be efficient uh, and frequent, run at the times people want, and actually be cost effective to use. Uh, and if we can't, you know, it's no good saying there will be, you know, a regular bus service provided by the developer for five years from Newtown Y into Stevenage or wherever it may be, if I pick on Stevenage, Sharon, if it's not being run at 7.30 in the morning so someone can go to work in Stevenage and then leaves at 5.30 in the afternoon to come back to work. And, and that's, it's not just providing the link, it's providing the services that go with it to encourage people onto the public transport. Because you can't get all those ducks in the row, no matter how many services we pump prime, people will not use them. I'll leave it at that given the time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I would agree with Sharon, a, a workshop spending yeah. more than just an hour and a half, two hours on this would be far more useful uh, going forward. I'm conscious we've got four minutes to go. We've got one more questioner and Mark, uh, two more questioners. I just wanted to come back. Um, I, I was meant to imply when my comment about developments causing drainage problems, I was implying that if you don't do anything about it, because if you put down tarmac and, and concrete, you, you take away soakaways and also patios as well. And that's why I say it's important to get the drainage right when we put new developments up. Underground garages, that's, that's an interesting one. And I think what will happen in the future will depend on demand, I suppose. But you could say to developers, if you put underground garages in, you can actually increase the density of your housing because you don't have to build a garage by the side of it. So there might be a sort of a double-edged sword there. Land ownership and documentation, I would suggest, is might be beyond the remit of our document because that's more down to uh, planning obligations and uh, local um, land ownership issues. But um, I stand to be corrected on that. Is there anything you wanted to come back on enforcement, Mark? Yes, thank you, Phil. Um, if I refer to my second slide, which showed all, all the supporting documents, um, enforcement will mainly be talked about in the network management strategy, because that's where highway enforcement sits in network management rather than in the DM team. Obviously, if DM, if my team need, need enforcement, generally we're reliant on going to the LPA's enforcement team for planning enforcement. So that, that was what I wanted to say about enforcement. Um, and, and maybe that will link into closer working with the uh, LPAs in any event. Um, you mentioned utilities, where we are helping there, and this will probably be on the, on the next round of chapters that you see, is that we're working up um, sort of generic cross sections. So a bit like what the government's got in their design code, we're working up our own set of uh, cross sections, which we hope would end up being not only embedded in the document, but end up being sort of standard drawings that we can, that the developer can use to uh, to give us the, the, the sort of width of street and cycleways and, and right, the right amount of green space, et cetera, and, and get those drainage swales in as well. Um, for the nine different street types and, and what we'll be doing there which we haven't done before is trying to help the developer by identify where we want the utilities so you know don't put a manhole in the middle of a circular tree of a roundabout which does happen <laughs> um but you know let's think about and be clever where the utilities go so that they can be accessed without causing obstruction to the highway or the free movement of, of people and traffic and you mentioned underground garages Maybe we'll take this offline, but I can point you to where um, we're just trying to align with the government code currently 
in what that's recommending. And like Phil said, it is about density. It is trying to take the parking to one place so that the electric requirements can be served. And um, if, I, if I refer to say some, you know, we've got sites like Bishop Stort for Goodyard, for example, where it's not underground in the traditional way you mentioned, but it's more under croft. So they have a nice pleasant garden that sits between the flats, but it's a first floor level and all the cars are hidden away underneath the undercroft. So there are there are there are blends of design, good design like that, which then frees up the street of all those motor cars. So that's that's part of the vision and training. Sorry, I want to come back on an earlier point about training. Yes, we've already we're already um, planning out our, our training regime for um, how we embed this document and train all the staff to know how to work with it and use it. And part of that will be an offer to all the DM committees uh, with the planning authorities in 2018-19. Myself, Trevor Mason and uh, Nick Goff, who's retired now, was, was out there doing training with um, district council members on planning committees. And yeah, absolutely, totally willing to do that again when we, when we adopt this document. OK, it's quarter two. We've got two more questioners. I would just invite the people, I mean, Stephen, I know, Judy, maybe is on the employment committee. If you want to go, please do. We'll understand. It's completely up to you whether you want your quarter now break or not. But we've got Sarah next. The question. Sarah Bedford. OK, perhaps Fiona, you'd like Hello. to... Hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I've been talking away for quite a while. No, um, I had this problem this morning you. on another team. Yep. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, on the case of garages, we don't have to build garages at all. Um, garages are quite often not used for parking anyway. They become an extension, an office, a spare bedroom, everything else, whether with planning permission or indeed just with a wall being built behind the garage door so nobody ever knows. And they then have an extension put across above them, which means the actual density of houses doesn't increase, although the amount of housing available to an individual does. Um, and actually we would be better served by putting parking somewhere else and not building garages. This is something that I have taken up at district level as part of our local plan. However, on, on to the main points I wanted to make, and a number have already been made and I will not repeat them. Um, two linked points I wanted to make which came up on one of the very early slides about facilities provided as part of larger new developments and the two um, the points on this that I wanted to make is firstly when you build community facilities as part of a new development and I'm talking about something quite large like a school or a doctor's surgery both of which are planned to be built on different developments uh, large developments planned for three rivers putting them right in the middle of the estate will mean that as many people will have to come from across that community to use them, and doctor surgeries in particular like to have a large number of people coming by car for obvious reasons, or ta uh, private or taxi, it actually means you're going to have more cars bumping their way through the estate around the very circuitous route that had been planned for them, and over probably um, some form of traffic calming or around some form of traffic calming, which is not good for those people living on the estate. So I'm not sure that actually putting things in the middle of the estate or spread out around them is particularly helpful, particularly also in the case of a school. Um, but also, we also have to think about where we are, what facilities we are adding to new estates, maybe of even four or five hundred houses, because if we actually add a set of shops or cafes to them and they are edge of settlement development, which quite which we're all being told to do, what you are doing is detracting from the existing facilities in high streets, cafes, etc., that we have within our communities who are already suffering extremely badly, both as a natural decline and as a result of the last year. And to put in more convenience stores, more local cafes and things like that, rather than encouraging people to walk two, three, four hundred yards into the current, um, the current development will actually lead to that high street closing down and more people driving even further away to a larger town centre. And I think we need to be very careful about what facilities are provided on larger new developments, how they are provided and where they are located within that development. 
Um, I did have a couple of other points to make about my county division, but Stephen's already nabbed them, but I'll let him off. Cheers. Interesting about um, where you place amenities and what the means you should place. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I would suggest a state's got to be pretty, pretty big that people can't walk from one end to the middle for an amenity. I know some people can't walk, can't cycle, but at the end of the day, I think it sort of underlines the problem. People seem to get in their car for just short trips. In fact, we, we are meant to be encouraging them to actually walk. And if we put something in the middle of an estate, then people have a little excuse but to walk or cycle. But anyway, that's a... Sorry, that's Phil, you, you misunderstood the point I was making. The point I'm making, for instance, there is a, a, a large settlement. Um, there is an estate of several hundred houses that like to be built on one of the larger settlements in Three Rivers. It will have the main doctor surgery for the entire settlement of several thousand houses. And it will be at one edge of that settlement rather than in the middle. So people are going to drive to it because the current patients live two miles away from the new doctor surgery. So that's my point. Not expecting people to walk within the site, to expect people to walk from one end of the settlement to the other. So perhaps I misheard you. I thought you were suggesting we shouldn't put things in the middle. And you're obviously saying the opposite thing. So sorry about that. But um, yeah, but we are trying to encourage people to walk. So where you site amenities within the states is very important i would suggest anything you'd like to come back on mark rupert no okay thank you uh fiona uh, to help michael out then in decorum last november we passed a new spd which stated that for new developments 50 percent of houses must have active electric charging points i don't know about the rest of the county so that's what we passed in the quorum and the information there are members of this council who are at this meeting who in 20 years time will be younger than some members are today god forbid <laughs> okay thanks for that fiona i've got to the end as far as I can see it. We've got quite a few um, recommendations here. Um, so the panel is invited to note and comment upon the report and in particular the front loading of the planning and design effort within the schemes preparation life cycle, the adoption and extension of the LTP4 compliance testing regime, the definition of sustainable modes, the key issues highlighted in the master planning and public design chapters, Next paragraph, panel is invited to endorse the following proposals. The proposed street lighting principle set out in paragraph 17.4, the proposed ITS strategy summarised in section 18, and the proposed revised commuted sum regime and charging structure set out in section 19. And finally, we're invited to vote uh, note that offices explore alternative stewardship models as discussed in section 15. If you could show you agree uh, for or against or abstain, please, in chat. You've got your hand up, Stephen. Did you want to mention something? I'm not disagreeing with what the, the recommendations are, but I'd be useful to have an offline discussion about the on-road charging points, as my division has the most on-road charging points in the entire county, and the borough has been successful in the government grant bid to get even more in for on-road charging points. I just don't want us to be the county then saying you can't have them. Hang on, but part of the, one of the 11 districts has got a load in and has got government money for it. So, so can we just have a dis so we yeah. don't cut across each other? I think that's the only yeah. issue. As I said at the time, anyone could come up with a workable solution. We'll be happy to consider them. So yes, yeah. please, yeah. 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 Can you can you note that Rupert to um, include Stephen in on discussions on this? Yeah, yeah, I can pick that up. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, there's no other part one business and no part two business. So thanks very much for quite a large and informative and interesting meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.